Hi everyone, I'm James Frazee. You might know me as the voice at the top of the Gear Club episodes letting you know what the show is going to be about, but I am also a producer on the show and now it seems a host. John and Stuart are busy guys, so I have been thrust from the editing room and into the big time to host this new format that we came up with called Catch Ups. We're bringing back previous guests to talk to them about what they've been up to since their episode aired and to ask the all-important question, why did you ever agree to do this in the first place? Let's get started. Mastering engineer extraordinaire Greg Kelby is a dear friend and was our guest on Gear Club episode number two, way back in January of 2017. Over the last 50 years, Greg has mastered a seemingly endless list of albums across every genre of music, and it's almost a certainty he's had a hand in making one of your favorite records. In this episode, Greg and I got to chat about Sterling Sound moving from Manhattan to its new facility in Edgewater, New Jersey, his workflow from converters to compressors to clients, and the unique changes, challenges, and expectations of modern mastering. We interviewed you in like 2016, 2017. Wow, it's like five, more than five years ago. Yeah, so a lot, a lot wow. has changed. You're in a new facility now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we moved, we moved here five years ago, so maybe we weren't even here yet. We weren't, maybe we weren't in Edgewater, but... Um, you weren't, you were still in the, yeah, yeah, in the Chelsea. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, you know, I just kind of been talking about this over the last couple of weeks and realizing that um, when we came to Edgewater, you know, Uber was not really a factor. It was kind of just buzzing around. It was, it was, it was available, but it wasn't you know, mm -hmm. what it is now, which is basically everybody's form of transportation in the New York, uh, New Jersey area besides their own automobile, right? Yeah, sure. So when we moved here, it was a ma it was a major factor. Now we're uh, we're up near the Washington Bridge, right? So, okay, so you don't have Uber, you got to either take a taxi from if you're in the city or in Brooklyn, you got to take an expensive taxi cab, pay double fare to go back and forth or go to Port Authority, take the bus, take the bus up River Road. I mean, it's a trek. Right. It's a real trek yeah. and it was a really a concern. You know, when we first looked to move to New Jersey, we were trying to stay closer to Hoboken, Jersey City, with the path. Yeah, sure. But it was it was still a factor. Like, are people really gonna from going to the Chelsea Market every day? Are they really gonna be interested in going to New Jersey, or is this gonna is this gonna affect our business? So it was a concern. Now, as it turned out over the last couple of years, Uber has become ubiquitous ubiquitous yeah. it is i mean it's everybody's taking uber everywhere you travel any city around the world now you to sure. have an uber you, you, can, you can't get lost you don't have to ask for directions you don't have to sit and wait at a taxi stand i mean it's phenomenal uh yeah. you know as, as the labor issue is another whole issue but as far as yeah, convenience sure. very similar to uh you know streaming audio you know the convenience is crazy whether people yeah, get paid fairly that's another issue but sure. yeah, it doesn't keep people from but people don't boycott uber because of, of that they take it anyway so no they keep taking it so that's we right. have benefited you know it's been a, it's it's been a huge benefit but at, and at the same time because of the, the, the uh, people sending files and mastering being less attended than it used to be, which is the really, in, in my world, kind of the, the biggest difference is that we do so much work by ourselves and then add a pandemic onto that where we had two years Oof. where people weren't even allowed in the studio. You know, I think yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people uh, got used to working alone and a lot of clients got used to the same thing that they got used to in mixing, which is the you know the engineer would do the mixes and send them, and then send notes, and then back and forth and back and forth, rather than sitting there all day in the control room. So things happening kind of all at once, different factors, all of them adding up to a very lucky for us that we're able to survive, you know, the rent situation in New York for as long as we could, sure. then move to Jersey and be able to buy a building and and have the security of of owning the building and People are coming and sending files. So uh, from a business standpoint, it's been a really great thing. And for me personally, because I live in Montclair, uh, not having to go through the tunnel every day back and forth and not having I to bet. spend 50 bucks a day to park, in my opinion, it's really extending my career because it's, re it's really not, it's huh. just ta has taken so much of the stress away from the day to day. And I can, I just feel it, you know, I get home predictably can get home from work every night and have fa uh, time with my wife and uh, time to relax and watch sports and everything. I mean, it was a very, you know, I commuted to New York for about 37, 38 years, you know, so it was pretty intense Yeah, uh, on, on a lot of different levels. But now that the pandemic's over, you're finding that anybody, anybody who wants to attend does. I mean, nobody's, yes. nobody's saying, well, I'm not going to attend because it's in Edgewater. We know, you know, we never get that. And actually, we actually get the reverse because actually from... 
from upstate New York or any place in Westchester, it's they don't have to go into the city. I mean, oh, people sure. really don't people don't want to go into the city w unless they have to these days. I mean, this is the yeah. vibe that we're getting. There's kind of been a real decentralization of uh, of New York's of New York City, I think. People want to know what what's behind this, you know, the curtain in in mastering and a lot, yeah. a lot of them come in and they've never been they, they might have made two or three albums. I had somebody recently who had had a fourth album. It was her fourth album. She had never been in any of her mastering sessions. Me and too. she was really into it, and she was really inquisitive in the right way, and she learned a lot, and she called me and said it was an invaluable you know, lesson in what we do, you know, and I think that, uh, I think I'm good at describing it, I'm probably better at describing it than I am at actually doing it these days, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> I'm, happy to, I'm happy to do it when people have the right attitude, you know, and it's... Uh, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm able to uh, when when uh, people do visit. Sometimes students come up. I've met a couple of, a couple of kids who came up, and you know, I'm always willing to to spend an hour or two. Sometimes yeah. I could tell in the first 15 minutes that it's not going to be interesting. Some people don't listen the way we listen, or don't have yeah, the sure. interest or the aptitude. The aptitude is really the wrong word. They just don't. They just they're listening to music in a different way. But mm -hmm. you catch somebody who really listens to what we listen to. And it's, it's fine if people don't hear. A lot of times, great musicians hear, and I'm, I'm going back and forth. You know, number one, number two, number one, number two, they go like, I don't hear the difference. I've learned over the years, everybody listens a different way, and you respect all the different ways they do. And the only thing that I don't like is yeah. when it becomes what I call like the listening Olympics. You know, there's a, you know, the guys that's like, oh, did you hear Ringo farted in the drum fill in uh, Octopus's Garden or something? It's like, oh, no, I didn't hear that. Well, go back, go back, you know, that kind of stuff. You know? Yeah, no, that's a good way to put it. Because, cause, yeah, because that's, that, well, and that's not the thing that matters either, right? No. <laughs> but let me, let me ask you a little more about the new, well, not so new now, but I mean, the new Sterling facility, you, you know, you had these new rooms built, right? Yeah. And you changed speakers, yeah, the, the the monitor environment is completely different. Yeah, so how I mean, I how did you how did you deal with that going from because you had your uh, Proax for like fifteen years or something, right? Um, I ha I had them all from I actually brought them. Yeah, I had them for more than twenty five years or so. But I, you know, I knew them inside and out. Right. Uh, as it turns out, my clients who who've been in this room, the new room, feel that this room is more uh, familiar to them. To their ear, to what they, oh, li interesting. What, they li what they listen to. The other room, I guess people a lot of times wouldn't tell me that, but they, they felt that the other room was kind of like they got a little confused when they got in there, which was okay. I mean, the, the, yeah. but the point, the point about that room, it was really a hi-fi system. It was hi-fi speakers. They were yeah. towers, you know, big towers, like almost six feet tall. Yeah, no, they were as big as a person. Yeah, it's yeah, they were big and and. They were just buttery. I mean, they were they were prettier. These are not pretty. These these are very very specific and very sterile. Well, now you have ATCs, right? ATCs, yeah, uh -huh. ATCs with uh, you know kind of a, cu a, a customized setup uh, with a t subwoofer and everything. And, and are they softened? Uh, they're in the yeah. wall. Yeah, they're in the wall, but there's glass. Uh, have you been in, been over here? I have I not. I would. I mean, yeah, I'd you love see, to. you it's see, a... there's like a glass. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so there's there's indirect light and there's like a whole setup that he that he did wow. to uh yeah, with the glass and, and glass is always a challenge. But the room sure. is very flat and very it's it's super flat, but it's just not it's not pretty. Like great stuff sounds amazing, but you really sure. learn after a while that a lot of stuff is not that great. I mean it's good, <laughs> but sure. to really go to that next thing, I think the other speed the, the Pro X had had a way they were just I just used the word buttery. I mean they were softer yeah. on the ears, the top end was a little bit more it was it, it it probably was splashier and higher and yeah. uh so so it was a it, it, and and probably the biggest the biggest difference was the bottom on these goes much lower than than what what I was getting uh for all those years and for some reason and I have theories about it for some reason people are mixing now with so much bottom yep. i mean we all talk i mean it's the stuff that comes in here is like it's just mind boggling and you just don't know if people like a lot of bottom or if they're hearing it or not they're hearing not it. It's hearing a very it. delicate yeah. it's a very delicate thing to try to figure out how to take it away but leave enough of it so that the, those that the, those that want big bottom I'm I'm actually I've actually moved to putting records out into the world with more bottom. I don't know. I just think that the phone and the earbud thing it, although this is not, you know, you don't master for those things, but I think there there's enough of that, there's enough and certain headphones, there's enough of th that that y if you have a little extra bottom, it, the record's going to sound a little bit bigger. If yeah. you have too much bottom, 
you know, on a, on a beautiful, you know, the old days with the receiver and the two speakers and everything, you know, yeah. the, the boominess doesn't sound good. In the car, I think people get used to a lot of bottom, and I, 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 don't, like to, yeah. I don't like to take too much of bottom away. I know how difficult it is for engineers to, to get good bass drum sound and good bass sound. It's, it's the biggest challenge. You're, you know, you're sure. an engineer. You know what I'm talking about. I always feel like I'm taking, I don't want to take away what somebody's worked really hard on, but I also don't want the, I don't want the mix to be overwhelmed by the bottom so you can't hear all the... Uh, the, the the action and I'm not a big fan of big bass drum you know between the super bo bottom of the kick drum and the crazy amount of cymbals and everything those are the two things that drive me crazy I think they're a big distraction to to, to music yeah no cymbal and cymbals are tough cymbals are really tough you can't change the way a guy's playing I mean all, there was yeah, there was one producer that I work with who he told me that he, oh he, oh I just go into the just go into the drum room I say don't hit don't hit it on this part of the cymbal hit it over here I said really if I was a drummer I tell you go fuck yourself yeah <laughs> anytime I tell a drummer can you can you play differently than how you're used to <laughs> it's oh it, like a they don't like it but b they can't really like it kills their vibe so yeah totally. you just gotta, you I don't just know even know how he, how, he, how he would do that but you know what I mean well, uh, that's one of the fun things about this job is that when, when you know, like I've never recorded anything, but I've talked to people about recording for so many years. So I kind of know all the answers, but sure. I still it's just so curious when I hear when I hear stuff, you know, and how you, how you got that sound or what is that or what happened yeah. there. I mean, it, and, you know, we have time. We have a lot of conversation time in, in, sure. in these sessions because I, I don't work in the box. When you work in the box. You can just uh, kind of come up with a setting and then just render it. It takes two seconds. But I have to dump everything in real time. I have to dump it of across course. from analog, you know, into, into my computer. And so it's a three and a half, four minute song. So, you know, when you're sitting there for four minutes, you start talking about your kids and about their kids. Yeah. And that's how I've gotten to know people in our business over all these years. And I love it. I, I, love, I love when they come in. You're also like one of the most personable mastering engineers <laughs> that I've, I've ever <laughs> met. I mean, you really, you have like a... You, yeah. you have a great vibe. You you make well, people thanks. very comfortable. Thank and you. I'm, I'm comfortable in this role. You know, I've 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 taken I've taken to be comfortable with it. So are you, so you you said earlier you've never recorded anything. Is that actually true? Well, no. I was an I was an assistant, but I never did a record on my own. I mean, I did yeah, when okay. I was a studio assistant at Record Plant. I had I had about a year. I had about two years where I would be a common, I would assist on the remote truck once in a while. That wasn't technical. That was just hauling wires, uh, you know, putting, putting yeah. audience mics up, driving the truck. With Hewitt. Cleaning up the stage, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, before Hewitt. I, actually, oh, I, was no on, I was on the truck before you. I, I remember Hewitt's first day, actually, very ah. clearly. Wow. Because I was on I was on the old truck, Cooster's truck, what became Cooster's oh, wow. truck. I was on yeah. that truck. And, I'm, and I remember David walked up. The reason I remember, he walked up 44th Street. And he had he was a real hippie guy. He had a really long hippie hair, and he he just looked like I said, you know. Basically, my thing was, who the fuck is this guy? And he, he was fr <laughs> he was friends with Frank Eubank, the guy that ran, ran the truck. So that was David's very first day on the truck, and wow. I thought he really knew it, but he he didn't know jack shit either when he started. You know, he just he came out of the blue. So, so I did that, and then I would be in the studio and basically setting up, you know, what they call the general job, which mm -hmm. was, you know, we had one, two. We had one, two, two, the two, one ups at three studios. So you had to make basically clean them up, make sure razor blades were new, you know that kind of stuff. Yep. China markers, mm -hmm. make everything kind of neat. And then during the sessions, I would just you know before uh, uh, there was no automation on the on the multi track, so you had yeah. to kind of rewind. You had to sit sure. there and rewind and mark it up with the China marker. You know yeah. old days. Tape up. Yeah. Yeah. Tape up. So that's what I was. That's what I was doing for a couple of years. But then I started helping out in the cutting room because my buddy was up in the cutting room and he was he was learning also while he was working. So I was kind of running around. And I remember I did a couple. I think I did twice. I might have done some rough mixes, uh, you know, because the engineer left and said, "Do me a favor, just do some balances and just send these guys uh, roughs." You know. So I think yeah. I did that maybe twice. Okay. But I never. I never had guys go in a room and just say, "Okay, you guys play. I'm going to put the mics up and record." I never did that ever. So uh, it's all by osmosis that I wow. did it. But that's why I like coming over to, you, to, your, to your place and I'm watching you work. Was I was doing all that comping the other day. That was killer. You're so fast. I couldn't believe how quickly. <laughs> couldn't believe how quickly. And the tuning was another. The tuning was just outrageous. I mean, yeah. just to, to see that and to, see, and, and to do it so elegantly and so I couldn't hear any, any artifacts at all. Maybe, you know, you guys tuned no. to hear that, but... Wow. Well, you can, but if you if you tune it and you hear that it's tuned, it's like it's like if you hear the edit, it's not a good edit. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you yeah. hear the tuning, yeah, it's not good tuning. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks, man, and it's great having you always. Well, to stop stop by whenever you know. Oh, we love it. Okay. We love it. We love it. 
super fun. So back because I'm very curious with Sterling, what was the learning curve like going from one room, one set of speakers to this whole other thing? What I had to do uh, was pretty much um, a, a ton of a being uh, mm-hmm. with every project. In other words, I had first of all, I, I knew that because I didn't know the speakers a hundred percent, I had to be very conservative with with what I was doing. I would rather do much less than ne- needed than do too much. Yeah. Um, the low end for about, I would say it took me. I would say six months by the time I would really be up to speed. Uh, maybe a month before I felt confident enough to make some bigger decisions than just like, okay, this is boomy or this is too bright. Uh, vocal level was tricky because there's a, the, mm-hmm. the mid range here is a little bit more present. So yeah, I had to kind of keep bringing C, uh, like CDs in that I kind of knew the way the vocal level was correct. And then kind of sure. listening. And that's, that's kind of a trip too, because sometimes in your, in your imagination, you hear, you've heard something for so long and then you realize in a studio situation that you really, that you thought you knew that, but you didn't. You know, listen to it at home. It was one thing. Listen to it in the studio. It's like, whoa, that's really a loud vocal. You know, and, and yeah, yeah, and 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 I think that as I got comfortable, it was also good. I don't think I had any super challenging stuff like in the beginning, no shootouts or any of that stuff. You know, yeah. um, and then the other thing that that these speakers actually was a big advantage is that the you know we talk about frequency responses mm-hmm. is one one aspect of the whole thing, but the other thing is like dynamics, right? And because the, because I'm in the middle, I'm, I'm about uh, maybe four and a half, five feet away from the speakers, and I'm right in the middle, and they're really wide, you know, super oh, wow. wide. So, so, so you're closer than you were. Much closer. I'm Chelsea. about three. I, I'd say three, three or four feet closer than I used to be. Wow. So, be, and because the, the, these are, you know, the drivers are bigger, so you really hear dynamics really clearly, you know. And this uh-huh. has been, this has become like the kind of the ba- major part of the job. People are sending us the mix and the loud mix. This is the, this is the thing. They, they have a mix, mm-hmm. and then they have the mix that they send to the client, which is always through some plug-in, which, which maximizes the sound to the point where the, the client can hear it. Uh, John Agnello never does this. He just sends them yeah. the mix, and if they say it's too quiet, he says, turn it up, and that's it. And he, never, he never gives me this, this bar. Stuart also doesn't do that. Some of the yeah, older no, engineers never, don't do that. I never do that, that with anybody. You, and you don't do it either, right? You know, Willie stuff, you didn't do that with Willie. No, no. And it gives me, that gives me the opportunity to kind of use my ear to try to get it to blend in a way that I think enhances it, right? Yeah. This, is not, this is not what's happening lately. What's happening lately is, I'm going to throw a percentage at this, but with, with indie rock, it's almost 100% of the time. They send you the mix, and then they send you the loud mix. And the loud mix can be, like, too loud. And if you do a mastering oh, and it's not no. as loud, it's not as loud as the loud mix. They will always tell you that it doesn't sound exciting, always. Well, so what right, you yeah. need to do, you need to set your levels and your plugins so that your mix is just as loud. But m- take your plugins and take all your inputs and take every well, everything that's happening and try to get more movement and more dynamics from from that mix than they had on their loud mix and sometimes yeah they put some special sauce on their loud mix that they don't even tell you about like they have another whole equalizer chain that's not on the main mix and now you, now there's a whole bunch of this happened to me on a record that came i think it was a i think it was a brazilian record and i don't know what this guy had but he had something that i just couldn't get the top end anything like what he had and i called him up and i said i don't know what plugin that you used because I, whatever highs you have on, on wow. you, you don't have those highs on the mix, but you have it on the loud one. He says, oh, I ran it through the thing. It was some kind of air, mm-hmm. air thing or something like that. I said, could you print that on the, on the quiet mix for me? He says, oh, sure, no problem. This is after I spent hours trying to get it. And then he printed that on the, on the other mix, and then I was able to get the more dynamics. Usually I can get more dynamics and get people really happy. But a lot of times they, they send you only the really loud mix. In which case, you just can't do it. You can't do anything relationally inside the mix because there's no headroom. Well, once so it's all, right, once it's limited, it's limited. You can't. Yeah, you there's can, no. Yeah, yeah, no one you doing. You can't do anything. Yeah. The worst case is when it's multi multiple producers, and a, mm-hmm. some of the producers send the super loud mix, and some of them don't send the loud mix. But then you have to take the guy's mix, and you have oh. to basically completely change it to fit in with the rest of the album. Because if you if you make the loud ones lower. Then the guy who makes them loud is not going to be happy. And the artist is going to go like, "What? 
It just happened t- two weeks ago. They, they had, I had to bring one mix down, and it's like, and I got a call. Can you can you make it more exciting? This 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 song sounded more exciting. I said, yeah, more exciting because it was two dB louder. But I louder. can't, yeah, I can't put it in the album louder because it'll be louder than all that. So this is a whole different way of working than listening to something musically wow. and figuring out, okay, the, well, I really w- would love it if that snare drum was a little bit, had a little more of a pop, but that's going to make the vocal a little bit a little bit uh, sharper, so I'm going to have to roll off a little in this. Uh, so there's like a sculptural aspect, which is completely to shit when, you, when you're doing this stuff. This is really different. This is a different thing. And all the, all so the this guys... So this is recent. Re- this is something that in the past five it's years grown, has become... Yeah, definitely, wow. definitely was not... It's like Uber. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that popular five or six years ago this is a big change in, in the mastering thing and uh it's not that much fun truthfully it takes no. a, it t- to me it takes the musicality away it becomes less of an art and more of like a technical skill i mean there's a, certainly an artistic bent to it but it just removes you a little bit from the musicality of the mix and more into the technical part of the mix I, if i could describe it that's about, that's how i would describe it for me yeah well and i know it's kind of like talking yourself out of a gig but I would be tempted to say, look, if you like, <laughs> if you like your loud version of this yeah. so much, then release it. Oh, I've said that. I have yeah, said that. You have. I said just use it. Yeah, just use. It. I said you can. You, you the sample rate is good. You know, there's there's not there's no clipping. If you like it, use it. I said I, I can't I can't improve it. I've 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 done that in albums where I go like the fourth song is exactly what you sent. Can't I can't do I can't make it sound better with from what you gave me. Okay, well yeah. we'll use that, and it, it does happen. Um, oh, you know, I don't, I don't really like to mention the names of projects, but you know, oh, there's, of course, there's some, of course. there's some major projects where I'll, I'll do a mastering and, uh, three of the songs of the 10 will be, uh, the, their loud versions and the other seven will be mine, or it could be five and five wow, where they're loud versions. Interesting. Yeah. Because it's sometimes I just can't, I can't get it to be any, any, any friendlier, which, you know, it's fine. It, it's, it's fine when it sounds good. The problem is when it sounds shitty. And then you're trying to master it and trying to make other things yeah, sure. that shouldn't be compressed have to be compressed in order to fit the rest of the stuff. So it's a lot of yeah, ooh, it's a lot of thinking, you know, a lot of strategizing and and also the politics of it. I mean, you don't want to criticize mixes that you get. You don't want to be critical. If somebody asks you, sure, it's fine, but you can't call up and go like, oh man, you crushed this one. Can you send me another one? I, I don't work that way. I mean. Decisions well, have already been made. Right? Yeah, People have right. sometimes already been paid. Everybody's good. And now all of a sudden you bring it over to Sterling and, and, and the guy's bitching all the time that there's a problem. And, you know, that's yeah, not, right. that's no, not that's good business. that's not a good look. No, that's no, right. No. And that's so interesting to me because it really does pen you in a little bit to, to have somebody basically doing a pseudo mastering job to hand to people. It amazes me that anybody would... Well, and the other thing... A really loud master, like if somebody hands you a loud version of a mix and and you're saying it's too loud, th- that means it's got to be screaming. And masters that loud, we're, we're kind of back in in some ways to original form because if, if you put a master that loud and try tried to make something that loud onto vinyl, the vinyl is a, that's another. See, this is something that we that we have to do now every once in a while. Sometimes we have to. We have an approved master, and then they want they want to cut vinyl. Yeah, and if they if they pushed really hard on the volume, I I, I it, if it's possible to do this, sometimes it's not possible. Uh, sometimes we we just we just call them and we say well, we're taking some of the level off, so we're gonna we're gonna decrease the maximization, so we're gonna get more dynamics. And and the explanation yeah. I give is always they never argue with. It. I say like if the dynamics that that we've killed once that goes to vinyl it's going it's just really not going to sound good because yeah, sure. the converter that it takes to make that analog again is not going to handle those peaks well and we're going to have to back off and everybody's okay with it and we do sure. you know when we have the opportunity we do make a vinyl master and that's what we do with the vinyl master however if all i have is the loud loud ones i have no ability to make it quieter because it, right. It, it, he'll yeah, br- I mean, sure. he'll bring it down on, on his console. It's you know, it's it's becoming analog. But the the, the D to A converter itself does not like to see those those kind of crush, super crushed loud. And I'm talking about loud. Right. I mean, I'm talking about I don't know on VU meters like a plus eleven or something. You can't even see the meters wow. moving. I mean, they're so loud. Even with a, I have like a nine dB offset, and sometimes the meter is just all yeah. the way on the other side. And and that was the approved one. And I had one recently, and I said, and, and I talked to the mixer about it. He said, "You should have seen the roughs 
He said the roughs were even louder. I had to match the roughs. So I said, okay, so somebody oh, did a rough mix, threw that's like 12 dB of maximization oh, on the it. The band yeah. always loves it because they're yep. all excited. They're making yeah. an album. It's like, woohoo, we got an yeah. album. I can listen to it at home. So this is all, okay, so then the other thing in the last bunch of years, which is really crazy, yeah. is the streaming. And the fact that, yeah. the fact that, like on Spotify, I mean, you you go on Spotify on your phone, and unless you turn the maximization off, which is not an easy page to find. I mean, yeah. m most regular people are not going to even think to look for it. But yeah. the, ma the maximization when you open Spotify is on. Mm -hmm. So everything comes down about 6 dB. Everything goes whoop all the way down. And it, yep. so you make this super loud file. Now you have no dynamics thinking it's going to jump out. But what happens is it just gets all the way pushed down. That's right. And now you have no volume and no dynamics. So here's the problem. The problem is if you're working for a record company or a small yeah. record company, are you, are you really going to ask them to make two masters, one for streaming and one for different streamers? There's a master. You have the master. And then from that point on, so what, what we try to do is we try to discourage the ultra loud stuff. We try, I, I try to make it sound good at a loud level, but once we get above a certain threshold, it's going to sound, it's going to sound not good. Yeah. But for the client to like be able to be happy with that after he's heard a, a louder one, it's, 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 it's a hard sell. It's a hard sell. Very I can hard. do it with people that I know, but you know, we get, you get so many people who send stuff in here that you, you never meet, you never did meet. And you, you know, you, you just, you just hope they do good. Now my, my yeah. partner, Steve Fallone is a fantastic mm -hmm. engineer and he has way more plugins than I have. He uses a whole bunch of stuff that I don't use and he's a master at it and he does, he does really good and he really get, he also. Oh, he's great. I've had, I've had records oh, he mastered. Very there. good. I mean, wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, sometimes I come in and listen to something he did the day before and I just go like, man, it's killing it really. But he, you know, he also have that same problem of having to match the loud one and, you know, I get all the traffic of what comes in, all the emails that come in. And, you sure. know, people call up a lot of times and they say, look, you know, we lost the dynamics, lost the dynamics, or we lost the dynamics. Then you got the people call, hey, can you make it louder? Can you make it louder? Can you make it louder? So you're, yeah, sure. I always like to think about this as an art. Yeah. But you're not, then it's not really, it's not really like an art. It then becomes some other kind of trade that I can't even put my name on because I'm not expressing myself or my taste. I'm accommodating all kinds of weird right. moving moving parts you know to try to kind of come up with a solution even within that you don't feel like you're like you're bringing your because i mean I, f I feel like i feel like you do when when i get a record back from you that's mastered yeah, but you I send feel me you like... send me something which is good and it can and it, it's enough there's enough room it, technically for it to be enhanced in a way that i can i can express how i want that to how i want that to yeah. sound you know yeah, yeah. But the, the other thing is, I, I, it, it makes the, the the creative window gets much tighter, because because there's a sure. there's a goal, and the goal is this level, and the goal is oh, this so you're ta right. You're talking yeah. about with the loud, like here's the quiet version, here's the loud version. Yeah, get, no, that's but, that, but this is a big. Right. It's I'm telling you, it's it, it, yeah. it's what it's what people are doing, and you got that, and you got, and then you have this the you know, the streaming, and the whole question about streaming. You know, you know, we, we get these calls. Every once in a while, somebody, well, I listened in a playlist and it was much quieter than the other song. And you know, my answer to that was, put it in another playlist. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know what, I don't know right, what the doctor, song was doctor, before. It hurts when I do this. Yeah, don't um, do it. Right, don't do that. I think Spotify, you know, when, when you take the maximization off, I think it sounds fine. I mean, I had title is actually sounds a little bit better. Yeah. But, totally. you know, their playlists are not as good. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're getting around the site. I mean, for some reason, the thing drives me crazy on title is that they, it's like the shuffle is on. It, it, it normals to shuffle. Oh mode. yeah, no, that's not good. Yeah, that's. Well, not I good. don't know how they get away with that. I mean, artists spend hours getting a good sequence and getting the gap. I know. And then it's like it's shuffle mode. Who the hell are you to <laughs> shuffle somebody's? Who makes these decisions at these tech companies? It drives not, me absolutely berserk. You know, not and, musicians. Nope, that's for sure. So man, you are predominantly analog still. You know, I right now I would say in my workflow I'm probably fifty fifty, but a lot of the big decisions come from the from the digital side now. I mean, the colors, the colors, like the input comes from all the different ways I have of just getting 
getting the transfer out of the you know out of the digital file. I mean, very rarely do we get analog tapes, so that's kind of not yeah. even really worth talking about right now. It's just a, sure. it just is a, a l one percent or something, right? No, but I mean, I take I take the signal path really seriously, and I and I try to get the one that maximizes the, the musicality of it. And when, but when, once I do that, and just with EQ EQ and everything, because all these all these plugins all they all have a little bit of a different EQ curve to them. Yeah, you know, like the precision sure. the precision limiter is a, is a kind of solid sounding, and the ozone mm -hmm. is kind of airy sounding, and the ozone maximizer is has a couple of different settings where it's it could be a little bit airy or it could be a little bit solid. So uh -huh. all these decisions are kind of EQ decisions that are done later building on what I what I created in the beginning of the input to the to the uh, to the software. Yeah, you're doing like anal your analog stuff, your your broad strokes and then even the the limiting though is happening kind of post that stuff the your, your final... i'm always I'm always listening to the limiting so i, I kind of yeah. get a, a ballpark to start i have like a standard start yeah so i have my standard start and then i listen for a while i go like oh no this is we're gonna have a little different standard start but it might change song to song and then i kind of i kind of switch it around and i won't be eqing at this point i'll just be kind of doing it in conjunction with the the uh, picking the the converter the a to d and the, the d to a and the a to d converter that's all kind of part of the analog side really you're you're and, so part of your mastering process is actually picking a a different a combination of a to d oh, and that's d a, a big, converters that's a, the major that's how it all starts i mean no I, there, kidding a, yeah because wow. the two d to a converters one is is clear and open and the bottom is kind of abnormal mm -hmm. and the other one has got a much bigger bottom and it's also got a little bit more for 400 cycles in the mids so wow. it's a more solid sound so yeah you know so i kind of i, I kind of figure that one out and then I, once i do that then i then i check the other on the other side i have i have two converters and one of them is again open and airy and pretty uh, you know pretty uh flat yeah. and uh, you know i just started about a month ago i just started working with this new neve and then neve has a completely other sound so if i'm looking for yeah. that so then you kind of weave together so you have like if even if you don't eq you have like four ways of just getting flat and then and when the clients come in they they they, they enjoy that but you know, if you have to do that all day long and go back and forth and change. So I try to come up with, I listen to all the songs first and I try to say, okay, this is going to be pretty much standard all the way through. And yeah. then we work internally to the mix. But, you know, like a lot of times if something needs a little bo a little bottom, I have, I have the, the way of doing it digitally and I have, you know, with the Ozone EQ or the Fab Filter EQ. And then I'll shoot it out with my, with my, uh, with my Sontech and see if my Sontech can do a little bit better on the bottom. Uh, most of the time, the analog on, for bottom, the analog is better. Mm. Uh, yeah, and we just got just got this new this new box, which I'm go only going to show you because it's so f freaking whacked out. See, there's no, there's no free there's no frequencies on it. I, there's no you really got to no use your ears, I guess. There's no markings. Holy cow. Yeah, there's like a little there's like a little sheet that comes a cheat with it. Sheet. <laughs> a cheat sheet, and you kind of get to know where everything is. And I've been Holy using that, cow. and that has that box has a definite sound if you go through it. And uh, kind of clarifies the top end a little bit, so you know hardware and software are together, and uh, and then try to get the work done. If there's anything else that that you got that you want to shit, you know, any like particularly cool projects or anything. The, the projects that that I'm having a lot most fun with are, are things that I'm kind of involved more in the in the uh, not in the mastering, but I have this one this one uh, friend who. Um, She's a fantastic singer, and I mm -hmm. keep waiting for her to record something over the last couple of years. And I and I called her oh. up about two two months ago. I said, "What is going on? You got to do something really good." And she she played me the beginnings of this this song. It was fantastic, and I don't know for some reason what I said to her really motivated the whole project and started moving things forward much oh, more beautiful. quickly. And then she's been sending me mixes and then you know the idea of what other instruments to put on it and all that kind of i'm not a producer but like it's funny because she would ask me like well what do you think we should add to this i'm like i'm not a producer i don't know i like some kind of a, a synth pad or something i don't know I'm, that's not what i do i just know that when i listen to it it sounds like a finished thing or it doesn't sound doesn't sound finished yeah sure. and she just sent me a final thing today where the the guy who's mixing it he did a really nice job and and so I've, I've been involved with that, and then this other band thing. I kind of got involved with this gal a little bit uh, in terms of her her approach, and uh, you know, I got a I got a bass, uh, uh, I got a beautiful present from James Mastro. Oh, and, and, I love James and, Sh and Shanahan. Yeah. They gave oh, me a bass for, for Christmas, bass and a bass amp, and I've been taking bass lessons. Oh, no kidding! Oh, yeah, fabulous! And, I, and, and I've been listening to the bass. I mean, I always check bass out. I love yeah. creative bass parts, but now I've really been focusing in on 
on bass parts and then taking these lessons and I've actually jammed with a couple of people and this is kind of the next the next stage you know music back to the music less less to the tech shit so yeah excellent no that's, that's excellent and that's and the Merkins and the Merkins, oh yeah, we, we'll be back. You haven't, yeah, haven't gotten rid of us it. yet. Tony wants it. to do it every time we get together. When are we going back in? When are we going back in? <laughs> it's such a weird feeling to to not really ever sing. Yeah, and then oh, to I bet. you know, although I you know I did about two years ago. I did go to a singing class in Montclair for a, in the autumn, and uh, she had me singing like Italian songs, like Oh Sola Mio, you know, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, no kidding. But I heard the voice come out of me that I, I thought was like, who the hell is that coming out? You know, it was really funny. But when yeah. I go in the studio, I think I did really good. And then Stuart always goes like, yeah, do another one. Yeah, it was great. It was great. I said, yeah. Then I go back and I listen to it. I go like, oh, that's so bad. That's terrible. And he goes, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. So anyway, all yeah. fun. No, it, it is, should be it fun, is right? Fun. It is. Get paid. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, it should be. Supposed to be. It's supposed you know? to be. Yeah, this was great. Good to, this good was to great, see you great. this way, and I'll get to see you in the next Merkins gig. Yeah, right on, Greg. <laughs> All right, All take right. it easy, man. Take it easy. All right. For more from Greg, check out his interview in Gear Club episode number two, and for some of his John Lennon stories, listen to Gear Club episode number eighty-eight, available at GearClubPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts.